Welcome to the Digital Health and Innovation Podcast, a publication of the Southern Medical Association. This podcast will educate and inform listeners on the various systems and methods that use information, data, and communication technologies to help resolve problems, reduce inefficiencies and costs, improve access, increase quality, and help make the practice of medicine more personalized and precise. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Andy Mohan, and I'm the co-chairman of the Digital Health and Innovation Committee. I hope everyone is pumped about for for a great podcast with our multi-talented guest speaker. Before I introduce our guest, though, I would like to quickly introduce Ms. Jennifer Price, who is our educational manager of the Southern Medical Association, and will also be one of the moderators for this discussion, along with myself. Additionally, I would like to also introduce Mr. Dylan Stevenson, who is our digital media specialist guru. We wouldn't be able to have such a quick turnaround in production of the podcast without our main man, Dylan. So thanks a bunch for your help, as always, Dylan, and making sure these podcasts are fine-tuned and released quickly. So moving on, we have joining us with us today, Dr. Kevin Johnson. Kevin is Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor and Chair of Biomedical Informatics and Professor of Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He is a very unique in the field, having served as the CIO for BUMC, as well as being an internationally known researcher, as well as having produced one documentary and one short film about informatics and information technology. His most recent endeavor is a podcast called Informatics in the Round, in which he discusses timely informatics topics with an expert, a comedian, and a songwriter on most episodes. Today, we're gonna talk to Kevin about various topics in informatics coming in in an understandable language for many of our listeners that aren't in the field. We're also gonna discuss the current pandemic, Kevin's path to becoming a leader and expert in informatics, the previous Vanderbilt Epic Go Live in 2017, his own amazing podcast, Informatics in a Round, as well as a bird's eye view of various healthcare topics and in- initiatives in informatics. So we are gonna go through a lot in a very short period amount of time. Before we begin, I would like to encourage our listeners to visit sma.org forward slash podcast to subscribe to the Digital Health and Innovation Podcast. So uh, moving forward, Kevin, I just wanna thank you for joining us, sir, today. Happy to be here. And uh, there's a lot going on, and uh, we're happy to have you here and uh, talk about various various different topics. Uh, I just want to start off on asking you how are you, how are things with you and your family uh, coping with this this current pandemic? Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about that and share some uh, share some of your stories? Well, sure. Thank you. That's very kind of you to ask. I don't think there's anybody in the country who's not feeling some stress from this. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of the sandwich generation, so I have daughter issues, son issues, other daughter issues, parent issues, and sibling issues. <laughs> so basically, like everybody else, you know, I'm, I'm answering the questions that everybody's asking. I'm dealing with the fact that my parents who live in senior living are, you know, not liking to be quarantined. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of the data that shows that couples who are spending about eight days or more together are feeling a lot of marital stress because they're not used to it. So uh, that's been my parents and it's been kind of um, a chore to deal with that. And then my my kids are out, you know, being wild 20 plus year olds who then are realizing that college is almost over. So they want to come home, but we are high risk over 60 year olds here. And the answer is not until you're clean. So that's been a fun <laughs> conversation to have. Yeah, it's um, it's been very different for my family as well, um, and you know, it's 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 tough for the kids. It's really really tough for a seven and four year old to be not be in school, not be in those social situations, those interactions. They're missing their friends. Um, I'm happy that they're missing school. That's a good sign. Uh, you know, a lot of kids probably are happy that they're not. Uh, having to go to school. Uh, we don't certainly want that, but, you know, it's certainly changed a lot of things. There's now there's teleschooling, those type of things. Um, but it's, it's created a, a very different type of environment uh, for all of us. And it's kind of, I guess this may be something that we get used to a new norm uh, where certain things that they come about, will be prepared in, in a better, uh, better situation 
going down, going down the line. Jennifer, how's your uh, experience been with all of this? It's a lot of family togetherness, you know, and it, it, it's an adjustment. I have a sophomore in college um, son who we're, we're adapting to online classes and being home and, you know, having to give up an apartment, um, you know, kind of in the middle of the semester. And it is stressful and we're trying to do our part to, to stay inside. And then when someone goes to the store that it's only one of us who goes and to get in and in and out as quickly as possible. But um, my husband and I both have um, parents, um, you know, John's father's in Florida taking care of his 83 year old sister when he's 85. And then my mother who has health conditions is two hours away. So, so we're adapting and doing the best that we can. It is a stressful time, but I, I think we will all get through it. You know, there's kind of three different perspectives on this and we've all addressed all three of them, right? So I, I started out by saying, Here's how it's affecting kind of my management. I think, you know, Jennifer's bringing up the other part, which is here are all the logistics that we have to think about to kind of get everybody else landed correctly. And then, you know, Andy, you're busy mentioning, reminding us that this is really hard for people. And I think it's all of that. Right. And, you know, that uh, I think we're all going to have to adapt to it and, and we're all going to learn from it. And, uh, you know, the younger kids are probably going to have to, uh, this is going to be their big story that they're going to kind of grow into in their lives. Um, you know, I think all of us have kind of experienced things, and this is something new for all of us. You know, coming from a Vanderbilt University Medical Center perspective, how has this impacted, uh, and you being one of the, 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 the leaders, uh, how has this impacted uh, VUMC? And where have they, what have they learned, and what have they done to mitigate this, uh, you know, this, this big pandemic? Well, frankly, we have a very visionary CEO and C-suite, and they have been on top of this since well before, frankly, the federal government or even our state government. So we were one of the first places to come up with testing and did so quickly. Um, I yeah. think that's helped us to get the curve flattened because we were recognizing how many positives we were getting out of the group of people we were testing. Um, I think, you know, stress and uh, some concern about bed capacity and everything that everybody else is concerned about. I will say, as a chair of an informatics department that's, you know, that's large and has a number of data scientists in it, I have been just thrilled by the number of ways people have thought about working together to build a registry for patients and to identify which variables should be a part of that registry. Um, it's really kind of activated all of our data scientists by, by giving everybody a chance to think about what are some of the hypotheses or what are some of the early signals. What are some of the ways we can use longitudinal data to predict the next group of patients who are going to have these same conditions or early signals? So I, I feel like we're we're helping to kind of recognize what the next wave of work should be from a research perspective. So it's nice to have a bunch of curious people. And then operationally, we have a, a number of faculty that you know well who are very involved with the front line. So building alerts and reminders and helping to generate the reports that we can use to give people a general sense of exposure risk and some pretty cool stuff uh, you know one of my favorite lines from the old santa claus sh sh um the the santa claus show was when the head elf said something like this is the best stuff to come out of the shop since the ball you know we we had some good good ideas come up from this that i i hope will turn into something useful for the country have you guys been using uh, telemedicine, uh, you know, quite a lot, or is that has there been a big shift to telemedicine visits, and how has that affected uh, the way that your uh, your population is managed? If you have been shifting more to that, that's a great question. Everyone in the country right now is it has an explosion of telemedicine. Uh, one of the quotes from a friend of mine, Chris Longhurst, um, was something like, uh, "We've advanced telemedicine in ten days." after having tried to do similar work over the past 10 years. And it's really the case that this has made everybody say, you have no choice. And every one of the healthcare providers in our place, you know, there's some growing pains on both sides, but they've really taken to the idea that they don't have a choice. There is no, you know, early adopter laggard. It's if you want to generate revenue for you and your family and everybody else, you're going to have to start doing telehealth visits. And so suddenly all the barriers have gone away. And we've, you know, notwithstanding issues of Zoom hacking and other things, we've all gotten used to using Zoom. 
our patients are learning how to use it through our portal. This has actually caused a massive uptake of the number of patients we have on our portal now. And then we've also dealt with education by getting medical students involved to help us to teach patients how to use um, Zoom as opposed to FaceTime, which is their favorite. So I think it's just completely revolutionized the way we think about telehealth. The big question here is gonna be, what happens next? Do we go back to what we used to do? Or now that the laws have all been relaxed, does this fundamentally change the sort of mobile first, telehealth first approach that we're currently taking now, even after the COVID-19 pandemic has subsided? The, the telehealth that they're using now, and this is something that I've thought of, and I'm sure patients are gonna think about this too, uh, Kevin, you know, there's four, levels observation palpation percussion auscultation which we all know as as, as providers but patients are going to they're in a telemedicine type of environment they're not going to get the touching and listening that patients are typically typically going to do um does that change is that going to change the quality of care or they're going to be you know a regulatory or deregulation of or pushing of devices that are going to monitor these patients um, or provide that same amount of quality of care does it change things? Well, I think the first study we actually have to do, and I, and I hate to be so blunt, but what the heck, we <laughs> all know those stages, but I'll bet yeah. you every single one of us on this call, as well as many other people who are listening to this podcast, can point to a recent encounter they've had with a healthcare system where there was no palpation, there was no percussion, there right. may not have even been very much observation. So if you say to me, to what extent is this going to take us further from the Osler traditions of healthcare? Yeah. I would say, I'm not so sure that we're that close anymore. If you said to me, to what extent do I think telemedicine is creating a different standard of care? I would say it probably is, but I don't know that there's any data that the outcomes relative to right now are any different. Now, if I had my druthers, I loved house calls when I was seeing patients a lot. And I felt that it was very important to do both observation and persuasion, the other P. And right. so I think that telemedicine from some work that we are seeing at Vanderbilt is leading to much more sophisticated observation. We're actually getting to observe patients in their home now. We're yeah. getting to see the distractions. We're getting to see the lighting. We're getting to see the stairs. We're getting to see everything that maybe subtly implies the right way to, tr to treat a disease. And because we're not spending as much time sort of doing perfunctory parts of the exam, we are spending important amounts of time with each family dealing with the actual set of recommendations and persuading them to be doing the right kinds of care themselves. So I think it needs to be studied. I think it's an open question. And I think we'll just have to see how that all plays out. And the reason I'm, I'm asking that is a lot of patients are going to be thinking about those things um, because they are they're used to seeing their patients or their, their providers face to face or their clinicians face to face. So this kind of changes a lot of things and you're just kind of you're pushed out into this this new this new realm uh, of technology and and and, uh, you know, seeing your clinician on a computer screen or cell phone, whatever it may be it changes that whole interaction, that whole experience of the patient patient encounter, the provider patient encounter. So um, I, I guess that's why I was looking into that. And that's this is kind of interesting. Everyone's using FaceTime and Zoom now, which was, it didn't have the, the HIPAA compliance uh, or the cybersecurity essentially to, to protect patient health uh, data, patient health information. What do you feel about that? Is that something that is going to be our new norm to where we are using FaceTimes, Zooms, these 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 platforms that weren't particularly a part of what healthcare was going to utilize as a platform? So I think we have to be careful about the extent to which there's any vulnerability using those particular platforms. I believe that CMS, you know, did come out and say that there are sufficient provisions in those two platforms that we aren't, in fact, in any violation of a HIPAA privacy concern or security concern. So my sense is that we, you know, to the extent that we could control sort of any teleconference, tele-environment, um, that we really haven't lost anything. Again, I haven't read deeply all of the information about the opinion of CMS, 
but yeah. I do believe that it's not perceived to be a step backward in terms of patient privacy. This may not be the new norm, essentially. This is just something that has just been deregulated. We're probably going to see something different uh, in terms of regulations in HIPAA. I guess that's a lot of what providers are looking at. Are they going to be, is this something that they're going to be able to utilize after this pandemic? We're looking at it in a rear view mirror. Let me say a couple more words about telemedicine, just because, since we're talking about it. I yes, think sir. the biggest game changer in terms of telemedicine has been deregulating the rules around state borders and around the extent to which I needed to be credentialed across state lines to take care of patients who saw me at my home institution across their state line. And the fact that we've relaxed those constraints, I think is a major game changer because that does mean that if I'm just checking in on my patient with, let's just say lupus to make sure they don't have active disease, and I can do that by using the camera and by having a conversation with them, which means I'm doing some really deep observation because I know where their lesions were last time. And I'm using tools that are fully interoperable with their electronic health record, then I'm probably saving everybody a ton of effort to get to another hospital, of time to park and go, get off work and just everything else. So I actually think that those regulations that have now been relaxed, if they hold, always an open question, may be one of the biggest game changers related to COVID-19 disease. COVID-19 disease and I mean, do you think that, or is this leading to the next Uber of healthcare? Meaning that, you know, you see, you, you have something, a platform, and you can access any physician that you want in the United States because of this deregulation of state lines. Is that is that a possibility that we're going to see something like that? I mean, I think patients would love it because, you know, with the, with the Cures Act and the, the rules there in terms of the patients owning their own, their health data through which with, with apps and with being able to access any physician, are we changing that whole paradigm? Is it a paradigm shift to something that we haven't seen yet? And is that going to be something new for us? I'm sure Jennifer yeah. would be pretty happy with that. <laughs> and I would uh -huh. be. What I would yeah. say is the, the field is open and it's a green field and the combination of 21st century cures and more familiarity with telemedicine will likely yeah. change people's comfort with seeing doctors who are far away, at least in follow-up. It, it really is, you know, I'm a very specific type of patient, right? So I think right. the, my ability to predict what most patients might want in this space is probably not worth the, you know, couple of electrons it takes to say it. I got you. I hear you, uh, Kevin. You know, these are these are very interesting times, and I, I think that it's gonna it's gonna benefit patients and everyone. It's gonna make things a lot more efficient, improve the quality of care, um, and hopefully reduce uh, the costs of of healthcare as well. Hopefully, so going from essentially a coder builder evaluation of software coming from a clinical perspective um, and informatics perspective into uh, uh, more of a budding medical humanities expert. Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and how it, you kind of changed in your course of your career? Well, sure, yeah. Um, when, I, when I first was at Hopkins after finishing at Stanford where I, I got my advanced degree in informatics, I came back to Hopkins and was very much a sort of pure clinical informaticist. And what I mean by that is I was thinking a lot about exactly what you said, how to take information that would be useful to the clinical enterprise and make it available at the point of care or wherever it was needed, home, et cetera, using technology because at the time those technologies didn't exist. And I ran into lots of barriers, but some of those barriers over time we were able to improve, especially in the areas like e-prescribing. Where it got really interesting is when I started doing health information exchange work here in, in the Memphis region, uh, we had a what's called a state and regional demonstration project grant that was co-funded by AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the state of Tennessee. And during that project, uh, a number of people, some of whom you know, like Dr. Mark Frissy and uh, others, Vicket Vicky Estrin, we Absolutely. were all working on this project, and we uncovered that 
it was becoming very successful, that we were actually finding new populations of patients and understanding what was happening in the emergency department. There were just great stories. And I was in charge of evaluating the system. So when I started putting together my plan for the evaluation, one of the first things that happened was some doctors in the emergency department said to me, well, just be careful because, you know, a lot of our patients, they talk. And if we start finding out that there's groups of patients who are using the healthcare system in a certain way, and we start telling them how we're able to know that, they're going to go home, they're going to talk to each other, and they're going to very quickly opt out of this electronic system for health information exchange. So it was, it was really kind of a tricky problem. And I happened to be talking to one of my friends here who is an actor, a guy named O'Neill Compton, who passed away recently. And O'Neill said to me, well, why don't you make a documentary about it? And I said, you know, you're crazy. And he goes, Kevin, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a documentary is going to be worth a thousand pictures. And you'll be able to cover the issues that, you, that are related to this project from the patient's perspective very comprehensively. And so I raised uh, about $600,000 over three years, and we did a film as the sort of final part of my evaluation for the Health Information Exchange. And that project turned out to be wildly positive. It got uh, covered by Politico. It got picked up by um, a lot of the Congress staffers who wanted to get copies of it. So they asked me to send them you know, free DVDs, of course, because that's how things happen in Washington. During the process, I realized that that ability to tell a story kind of really leveraged, probably they're not the best word, but leveraged a lot of the skills that I've had in my life outside of medicine forever. I've been a photographer, I sing, and I'm very much involved with music, and I love telling stories, and I'm pretty creative. So since that time, I've had a chance to do uh, two other short films, and I'm working perhaps on a larger feature right now. So it's been a, a fun side to my otherwise mostly technical work. Uh, Kevin, you know, I, I do, and I, I think Jennifer and I have talked about this in the past. Uh, we do we do have a interest in acting. So if you do need some some actors, we certainly can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, well, Talk to my agent. I don't have an agent. I represent myself, uh, but I'll, I'll be happy to happy to do anything uh, to help you out with that venture. Um, and I did. I, I really enjoyed your uh, your documentary, and uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, tell people, our listeners, ab about that documentary, it's whether or not you're you're an informatician or you have any expertise, uh, that that documentary really makes it very easy to understand the philosophy or what they were trying to do, or the HIE, the Health Information Exchanges, and how it works and how it functions for providers and how it makes it better for patients. So. Um, my, you know, I've seen it before. I actually saw that uh, documentary about four years ago or something when I was at Vanderbilt, and uh, I had I watched it again because I, I remembered and I wanted my my mom to watch it, and my mom watched it and she absolutely uh, she loved it and she loved it. It was very easy for her to understand. She started asking a lot of questions, so it makes it makes people that watch it very engaged in the technology of healthcare and how things can be if we we kind of strive for these these different uh tools that we can utilize so uh, i just i, I just want to commend you on that that documentary it's, it's fantastic well thanks so much for that uh i've heard similar things we when you first start a, a project like this you always want your friends to see it which, and you realize your friends are going to basically be unbelievably biased so we did a screening and invited spouses as well as friends and the spouses were going home i was told asking exactly the kinds of questions it sounds like that you and your mom were going over. And yeah. I got all this feedback that said, well, you've completely engaged, you know, my husband or wife who never understood what I did and now have all these questions about it. So, so that was kind of exciting to hear. Uh, what kind of, uh, so what, what's in the, uh, what's down coming down the pike in terms of your new ventures uh, with, doing another documentary do you have is there any or is it is something that you can talk about now or do you want to kind of yeah. hold off and release it or sure this is not like a you know documentaries aren't like a major pixar release right so they're not going to make any money um the one i did the first time was called no matter where 
and yeah. it's still available on Amazon Prime and actually still doing quite well on Amazon Prime. The one that we are going to eventually get on YouTube, but I need to get a little bit more clearance, and I can talk about it if you want, is we did a short video about our Epic Go Live, our EHR Go Live, by following a group of people over an 18-month period, starting six months before we went live to a year after. And I'll tell you a bit about that one because I was really proud of this project. When we decided that we were gonna replace our electronic health record, and you may remember that I was the CIO at Vanderbilt for about five years. Um, yes, sir. Before I got smart enough to realize that was not a great thing for me to be doing. Um, and during my tenure, I had to replace our system with Epic, which was you know a four hospital environment. We did a giant big bang, inpatient, outpatient, revenue cycle, um, it was very complicated. So I went online to see kind of what go lives look like and went to YouTube. And there's a number of videos on YouTube, but they're all about the sort of eight hours when you flip the switch. Not one of them really went into any detail about everything that happened afterwards. And in the informatics literature, there's a thing called the J curve where you go from a certain level of satisfaction and then if you can imagine that time is ticking to the right, and then right after you go live, your satisfaction goes down, and then over time, your satisfaction comes up to where it was, and hopefully over a little bit more time, your satisfaction with the technology goes up even beyond where it was when you start. That's why it looks like a J, and we call that a J curve. None of the films really covered this. So I set out to cover the J curve, and. We were able to pull that off by filming one nurse and then a number of other people through the whole process. And, and I think it was very, very powerful. I don't know if either of you had a chance to peek I, at it. I, I, I watched it and uh, I, I do want to find out if that nurse, uh, I know that she had a difficult time that day one and yeah. it got better for her. Has she cried again? Because I mean, it's, it, it's a very tough thing. And when you're trying to, when you're trying to take care of patients and you have this new technology and you got to input all this data and you have blah, 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 so many things going. You may have a complicated patient. It makes things pretty tough. And that day one, uh, and I, you guys would probably end up watching it. She was a nurse. Uh, she's a nurse. I can't remember. I think she's a, a neonatal uh, nurse. She's a pediatric intensivist nurse. Okay, she's a pediatric intensivist. Uh, she was uh, very upset initially. And then, you know, they, uh, during the, the the video uh they followed her and and she she you know i guess she learned the system she her questions were answered um but she had a difficult time and i think that's just kind of a normal thing but i thought it was a very very well uh done small segment of what goes on during a go live over a period of time uh yeah. not even the go live over implementation go live and post go live is is very interesting to see that and i think that's kind of the typical um the, that's the typical the, the, those are the typical things that go on during a go live. I think it happens throughout every single healthcare system, at least to what I've seen. And I think you, uh, what would you, what would you think, Kevin? Well, what shocked me was we went into this, you know, we first interviewed her and she's a very experienced nurse who's been around healthcare before. And she really had a very naive opinion about how that day was going to go. You know, one of the things she ends up saying on the film is, you know, it's going to be one of those little things. We'll all talk about a year from now. We'll have a little blip. A couple things will go wrong, and then we'll be fine. And, of course, that's not what happened, although that actually is what happened. So when you're living it, those little blips feel like the world is caving in. And it just so happened, you know, as a, as a documentarian, you don't know what you're going to get. But that we filmed looking in a unit that we thought could have things go wrong if anything was to go wrong. And that was a good decision. And we wanted to make sure we caught a nurse for the entire period, as well as a doctor for the entire period. That did not work. But it just so happened that the bad thing happened to that nurse in that unit while we were filming. And so wow. therefore we caught a really classic, sad moment that you find right afterwards. You know, a month later she tells you, it was probably an hour later that everything was fine. It was all fixed, it was great, and she's never had a problem since then. So uh, yeah, I mean, we we had some really fantastic positive stories. And if you went around, there were one or two people who said this was like the worst day they ever had in healthcare. 
So I think that's pretty typical. What's amazing now is things like we were just describing, bringing up telemedicine in 24 hours would have been absolutely impossible had we not made the move to uh, a, a commercial EHR that already had a telemedicine solution waiting for us to use it. So you think, I mean, in, in, and what about like uh, your uh, going to the implementation, uh, your, the providers that were going through that day one, were there, uh, you know, how, how, was, how did they react to the changeover? Um, yeah. Was it a smooth transition, would you say, or were there difficulties? I there. think it was from place to place, it was very different. I had a chance to round all through the hospital and then the other hospitals and the lab and some other locations. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that if you were talking to an inpatient doctor, they didn't have the pressure. Therefore, they had a little bit more time to figure things out. And even though there were some parts of it that were a workflow they weren't used to, they figured it out pretty quickly. If you were to talk to the docs in the ED, they had long ago had a strong physician champion who taught them all the importance of getting in the sandbox and testing the system. So the ED emergency department really didn't struggle one little bit. They, in fact, I went down there and they all had iPads and they're like, dude, this Canto thing is rocking. It's great to have the whole EHR on my pad. I can take it everywhere I want to go. And, you know, they were just in love with it. And so, you know, that made us feel good. But if you were to go to the ambulatory environments where there were Lots of teams, a fair number of physicians who don't come in every single day to see patients because it's an academic medical center, and a fair amount of patients who were different from one another, which meant different workflows. They were really struggling, and they were struggling with the in baskets, and they were struggling with the number of clicks and all the things you we've all heard about nationally. And I really understood it better, kind of watching them in those first couple of months. But if you go there now, what you probably find is there are certain doctors who don't understand why they're doing these things, but they're doing them and they're doing them without complaining about it. What do you think is the biggest, was the biggest challenge for, for providers? Because a lot of times when I've seen it, they're, they're having difficulties finding things. And this is kind of moving into my next uh, question as well. Um, right. And what Vanderbilt's doing, and we actually did uh, have a chance to speak with her uh, and she's amazing, is is uh, Dr. Yakuma Crystal in terms right. of Viva. So they have difficulties finding things within the EHR, which gets them frustrated. And they, they're going to click one or two times to try to find it, and they're going to be like, forget about it. And you know, that's something that Ya, she talked about. Where are you guys with that? Because I just thought that was amazing. And can you just give a brief description to our listeners that may have not listened to that previous podcast on what that is? Sure. Let me give a little bit of a background and then talk about it. So one of the things that we identified pretty quickly is that when you create an electronic medical record, you are literally taking a medical record, all of the pages, all of the charts, all of the tabs, and making an electronic version of it. What we had before um, our commercial vendor was a very different homegrown system that had a kind of patient perspective, but also a information perspective. So if you will, there weren't really tabs to go looking around for all the chart. There were ways to find things as a part of putting a story together. So while I would say it was the case that many people who used our previous electronic record couldn't find everything, most people could find the things they needed on a, on a day to day uh, basis because they were used to using the search functions. In comes this new system where although there is a search function, and by the way, it works very similarly, most people weren't as familiar with it. And in fact, were trained to use a series of menus. Well, they got lost in those menus. And furthermore, when you finally got to the piece of information you would want, you were nowhere near the next piece of information you would want. So it wasn't really possible to have a stream of consciousness data gathering process. So when Yah and others looked at that and started looking at the technologies around our home, the first thing that she recognized was that some of the voice-enabled agents that we all have in our houses, Amazon, Siri, Google, could do a really good job if they were attached to an electronic health record. So she started a project called Viva, which stood for the Vanderbilt Enhanced Voice Assistant or EHR Voice Assistant, that essentially allowed you to have a voice-enabled agent 
type conversation with the electronic health record. And so you can ask questions like, tell me about that patient or what was their last lab result? So if you're diabetic, what was their last hemoglobin A1C? And not only do you get the answer you want, but because Ya is an expert, she recognized that the real intent you have in asking for a lab is to know its trend. It's going up, it's going down, it's been the same for six months. So she's built in all of those types of responses by querying the record and then kind of creating text summaries of graphical data. So it's been a very powerful concept and Epic's been very excited about it as a vendor. Uh, I'm certain when we show it to some of the other vendors, they'll be very excited about it. And the next step is gonna basically be a pilot of this to see what our providers think. The small pilot that we've done so far has been very positive. That's amazing. We're looking forward to uh, to delving back into that in the future to find out where you guys are and to, uh, uh, you know, it's it just, I, I think it's going to be great for providers to have that that type of tool available to them. Uh, it just, it'll make it uh, so much easier when they see their patients. Yeah, um, I, I think about the use case of driving to work. You know, my use case is I'm, I've been listening to your podcast and now I'm done and I'm 10 minutes from getting to work and I just want to Kind of have a general sense of what's on my calendar yeah. and i do that already with siri but if i right. could go one level deeper and say tell me about the patients i'm going to see today and have it tell me each patient summarize it let me ask questions so that i can know up front what i was thinking about having to do with each patient i'm going to have a way better start to my day so that's the use case that i keep reminding us that we should go for what other with the ehr that you guys have implemented what kind of improvements have you guys fo kind of focused on to make things better for patients and providers? And what are some of the future goals from now, you know, leading into the future to make well, things, to utilize that technology to make things better? Yeah. So when you look at an electronic health record, you can kind of divide the functionality into two broad categories. There's the inform information retrieval functionalities. And Viva is really good at that. It's very good at asking questions that are random throughout the EHR, making you not have to do a lot of clicks and then getting back a response. The other thing that we've been doing in the information retrieval space is a project called the Word Cloud Project, which is very much based on work that Noemi Elida did at Columbia in a project called Harvest. And in both projects, essentially, we fully read the entire health record for a patient and we generate every concept from that record. And in, and in our case, we then display that graphically so that concepts that have been around the longest or that seem to be the most pervasive are bigger. Concepts that haven't been mentioned in the last three years are colored differently. And as you click on each concept, it automatically takes you to the parts of the electronic health record that are relevant for that concept. So it's a pretty powerful way to get a patient story. So we have Viva, we have the Word Cloud project on the information retrieval side. The other side is generating the note. And there's been a couple of things that we've been trying to do to generate the note, one of which is to completely rethink the whole process of note creation. A project that I did called Breadcrumbs with one of my students, Leanne Tang, looked at the audit trail from the electronic health record, if you will, the user actions that are kind of ex the exhaust using the EHR and then trying to determine from looking at the user actions and the audit log what was actually done and then seeing if what we could then generate through natural language generation looked like the note. So the idea is you use the electronic health record to do things you need to do and then the ele electronic health record automatically generates your document. So we've been playing around with that idea. We've been playing around with the idea of using video and we've certainly been looking at ways to improve our order entry by using voice. In fact, one of the first things we've done is we've plugged voice-based order entry into Viva so that while you're hearing that whole history of the patient, you can say things like order this lab, order that lab, and have all of those queued up and ready to go. So those are kind of the two parts, and that's the way we're addressing it. That's uh, that's uh, Those are all very, very good. Uh excellent tools for uh, providers and i think patients would love to they just like being a part of that type of encounter seeing yeah. so, so much ease so that your your provider can just focus on them 
you know, on right. the patient themselves. So this just makes it so much easier for them. Um, you know, I kind of, I'm going to take a little tangent, you know, I'm glad that things are going well with the implementation and, and, you know, now it's already been a couple of years or three years now, um, you know, since, uh, since you guys implemented in 2017, uh, you've been doing some pretty interesting stuff. And I had, I had a chance to listen to a few podcasts. Uh, you've been doing a podcast uh, and it's called, uh, I, what is it called again? It's called, uh, it's informatics. It's uh, around the inform informatics. And go ahead, Kevin. It's called around informatics in a round, correct? That's not it. It's called informatics in the round. That was fun to watch you struggle with that, though. Yeah, I was struggling a little bit with that, and uh, it's uh, it's it's a very very uh, very interesting podcast. Uh, how did you think about this, and how did this come about? Why did you decide to create a podcast um, to discuss? And I love the people that you're bringing on, too. I mean, they're just, they're very, the personalities that you're bringing on, and the the, uh, the, the comedy. I just, I love the comedy, and it's it's not only, it gives great information, but it's also making you giggle. How did you come up with this concept uh, into something like this? Well, the fact that you love the comedy has made my day. That's like, I think that's probably <laughs> the best thing you could say. Um, no, I, so, I, I strive to be a comedian myself. I've done I've I've done a couple of stand-ups, uh, which are pretty bad. But I I shouldn't actually say that. But uh, um, it's 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 hard just to get on stage. I'll tell you that much. So the comedy is fantastic. But these are people that are just naturally comedic, and they have great personalities. And it's it's nice right. breath of fresh air. So here's the here's the story. So it's called Informatics in the Round. That was actually a name that was chosen from about 60 names that people provided to me because, and you'll hear this in the in the episode called Naming My Baby, because we go through the finalists in that episode, but it has to do with the fact that In The Round is a Nashville concept. So Nashville is Music City, and In The Round is the format that songwriters take when they're going to play a song and then kind of riff off each other's song. So one plays a song, others do harmony. The next one plays a song, others do harmony, and they just keep going around and around and around. And so that was a great name for a podcast that was going to be in Nashville. Um, my original idea, which had a terrible name, was going to be called Kitchen Table Science. And the idea was that every Thanksgiving I go home and people try to ask me what I do, and I try to explain it to them, and it took for, it takes forever, but they typically would get it. And so the idea was that I would create a podcast so that we could help people who want to understand what biomedical informatics is to understand it without lots of fancy words. And that would help us with our training program. That obviously helps us to disseminate key ideas internationally. So as long as we're not using overly sophisticated words, we think that the message translates better to a larger audience. I was very careful to make sure that as many episodes as possible have one internationally known or nationally known informatics expert, plus me, one songwriter or someone who's in the music business in some other way, and then one irreverent comedian, the exactly the character you said. So every episode, that's the, that's the sauce. And I make sure that everybody has a few minutes before we start to kind of gel and feel comfortable saying whatever they want to say and then we just go and we have one or two topics we so far have one topic mostly and a second topic if it comes up and we just talk about it for 40 minutes to an hour and get into whatever the people who aren't informatics experts think are the way that we should talk about it so we don't drive that conversation we actually let our songwriter and our comedian type person drive it and therefore, it stays light, it stays accessible, and so far it's gone really well. We're actually a number of episodes in. You've heard, I won't tell you the number because it doesn't matter because it's a podcast and I don't know when it's airing. I saw five. You have five on, uh, uh, I'm using Spotify, Podbean on Spotify. It's just easy to listen to, and it's. Uh, and I, I kind of understand your target population is pretty much everyone, which is right. nice. It's not yeah. very easy to understand, and, and it's, it's uh, pretty smooth. And I'll tell you one thing, Kevin. It's uh, you have a you have a, you have a definite um, uh, comedic talent. So I'd love to see you on uh, some stand up at some point. And it won't be happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, it's been, what was fun about it. I mean, I I used to be a radio DJ in college, and as I mentioned from before, 
one of my interests in humanities is that I, I like being creative and I like being curious. And so one of the nice things about this format is you can be all of those things, right? You can take crazy ideas, you can edit in things that you think make it more interesting. You can edit out the parts that are clearly not. So you get to learn a little bit about audio editing, as you know. Um, we're going to probably start doing some video episodes this year, too, because um, that's turning out to be more and more of something people want. But uh, it, it's, a, it's been a really great vehicle for me to introduce the world to some of the top people in the field and for me to also, frankly, get out and be introduced to a lot of people who don't know anything about informatics. One of the things I hope that's going to happen from this podcast is that we will get an opportunity to do more podcasts like this one. We'll get an opportunity to work on a few more medical humanities projects. And there's a couple that I've been thinking about that are primarily around the pipeline of getting younger people interested in biomedical informatics. And that uh, it will hopefully get me an audience for me telling my own personal story to people who want to hear it. Yeah, that would be uh, that, that's that's all very very um, resonant to, to all of us, and we we would uh, we'd love to see more of that. Uh, I'd love love to hear more podcasts as well. Um, Jennifer, do you have something that you'd like to add um, to this discussion in terms of uh, these podcasts and different uh, you documentaries that uh, Dr. Johnson has uh, created? First of all, as someone who is not very techno savvy, but works in the medical field and is a patient slash healthcare consumer, thank you for what you're doing. Because when things come at you in a way that you don't understand, you, you kind of tune out and you don't become as engaged as I think we should be. I think patient empowerment is important. So as, as you develop these things, you know, um, not only for people who don't have an informatics background, but are involved in the technology field, I think as someone like me, I, I think um, I can benefit from things like this. So um, it's been very enlightening and interesting to me to learn more about this. Yay. You <laughs> made my day too. Yeah, Dr. Johnson uh, or Kevin, I do have uh, one question in regards to the podcast, uh, and it, it's such a very interesting topic. Um, and it's something that's very confusing for a lot of people that just don't understand what it is. It's artificial intelligence. And right. we look at artificial intelligence from all sorts of different aspects of our lives and how it's kind of affecting things. Like, for example, the self-driving car. Um, you know, that's that's kind of an interesting place, just seeing a car that's able to drive itself. And, and the artificial intelligence, AI, how is that going to integrate into healthcare? Or is, I mean, parts of it have already started and we've already started seeing somewhat of a change. And how are patients, what are they supposed to understand to how that's going to change their lives as a patient uh, and provider and how are providers going to be interacting and how is that going to change their lives yeah and their work and those type of things in a very bird's eye view right so i think the first part of that bird's eye view is that we call it ai and ai can mean one of two things and it turns out that this matters um, ai can be artificial intelligence but ai also can mean augmented intelligence uh, when we think about those two together, the idea essentially is that there are tasks that you might have expected a human to do that can now be relegated, at least in part, to a computer. And we are already starting to see a number of what I'll call back office AI, which means technologies that help to predict things like readmissions, patients' risk of being COVID positive. You know, that's all work that's happening right now patients who might be clinically deteriorating in the hospital. There are some AI algorithms that some of the vendors have that provide an alert to providers when they start seeing that there's patients who are clinically deteriorating. So I think the integration is happening. We could talk a lot more about the challenges of integration, so maybe that's a separate episode we could do. I think there's ways that patients are gonna see this that are gonna be kind of behind the scenes for them and possibly something that even providers didn't know existed. So one of the ones we learned about is that many pathology departments use AI to review a slide and to digitally circle um, cells that may be abnormal. That's actually been happening in a lot of pathology departments for years, and none of us knew it. And so the job of the person who's reading the, uh, reading the slide is to first go through and look at all the cells that were circled by the computer. 
that technology, which is augmenting the ability to diagnose things on a slide, is very similar to what we're going to see in radiology, where these early algorithms are demonstrating superior capability to I identify lesions on films. And the key thing is, regardless of the day or time that that film has been obtained. So if you're the radiologist and you've been in the reading room for 10 hours and you've got one more film to read, you're probably a little fatigued and you're thinking about going home. You don't want to, but that's just human nature. Computers aren't thinking about those things. So they're gonna have the exact same performance every single minute of every single day. And as long as we are being augmented by them, I would be willing to bet you studies will show up that demonstrate that those computers are really helping doctors, especially in long after long days and with more complex cases, not so high quality films, et cetera. So I think we're gonna see this from the standpoint of providers getting augmented help from the standpoint of patients, I think what we're gonna see and already are seeing it is some ability to democratize the process of diagnosing or pointing out potential risks, things like drug-drug interactions, some of which are very simple, just rule-based systems, some of which are much more sophisticated because as you may know, Andy, you may not know, Jennifer, most of what we do in terms of drug-drug interactions are only pairwise comparisons, this drug versus that drug they don't take into account that you're on four medicines and that something can happen because of three of those medicines that interacts with the fourth. We have no data around that area to speak of. So we think that there may be ways that we can use machine learning to do much more sophisticated kind of drug profiling and risk profiling for patients. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So assuming that uh, we don't spend all of our time thinking about coronavirus for the next five years, which I don't think we will, I fully expect to see more and more artificial and augmented intelligence entering into healthcare um, every single year. But do you think this is going to take away what providers do? We're still going to see providers, correct? Yeah. As from yeah. a patient perspective, it's not we're not going to see a robot, you know, that's like Watson's telling us, hey, do you know, do this, this, and this, this is yeah. what you have based on you know, this yeah, and that. There's a radiologist named Kurt Langlocks, who's also an informatics guy at Stanford. And yeah. Kurt it was quoted as saying something which I think is brilliant, which is radiologists are not going to be placed, replaced by computers, but radiologists who use computers will probably replace radiologists who don't. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, pretty, pretty, it's pretty elegant, right? I mean, it just basically says what I just said, which is the healthcare system knows that we are fallible as humans. And, and it's, you know, I happen to have a, a self-driving car. And I will tell you that while it's a toy during the day, I don't have the best vision at night. And it's a great thing to have that feature late at night when I'm coming home from something. And I just want to make sure that I'm paying attention to the speed limit, staying within the lines and driving reasonably. One thing about a self-driving car is it follows the speed limits. So yeah. while you might be thinking, I'm tired, I'm going to get home, it doesn't do that. It drives at exactly what the speed limit is, and I just have to sort of grin and bear it. And that's why we're seeing data that suggests that as we have a larger and larger fleet of self-driving cars, roads will likely be safer. So I think the same thing's going to be the case with healthcare, and it'll be very difficult to consider your practice delivering standard of care if you don't have that level of fault tolerance. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think about that? How do you feel about all of this artificial or augmented intelligence um, integrating and, and, and making things better for, uh, for healthcare systems and providers, patients. Well, I too have a self-driving car, so I, I completely agree that when you're tired and things and it goes the speed limit, I do, I do think you know things like that make it safer. So I, I can absolutely relate to that. And then um, my mother had a drug interaction um, that was kind of scary because um, not all of her medications were taken into account. You were talking about the comparison of two meds, but not necessarily multiple ones. And that's exactly what happened. So I think as the technology evolves and if it can prevent things like that, um, I, I think that is absolutely wonderful. And we didn't even plan that. <laughs> See? Sometimes the best things come out when, when it's not really even part of the original, original plan. 
That's right. Well, uh, Kevin, you know, it's it, we have a few more minutes, and uh, you know, I do have one more question, but I do, you know, I want to thank you uh, for enlightening us. You, you've added uh, so much to um, to our listeners and and uh, enlighten them to learn more about informatics and and where things are going and and all of these different things. Um, you know, it's right now we're going through all this, you know, the pandemic, social distancing, um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are unknown. Um, to our listeners, what what would you add? What kind of pearl? What would be a Kevin quote unquote uh, Kevin pearl uh, during these very uncertain times uh, that we've never seen before uh, under this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic? You have something that would enlighten us or bring us together, or something that we can kind of uh, uh, take away from this. Well, I have a couple, and and you know it's funny. Back in the old days of medicine, we would call those Kevinisms. You ever have that <laughs> phrase? You know, pick your favorite person isms was what they used to always say. So, was there an Oslerism or a Murphyism or whatever? So, yeah. it's pretty cool that you think I have Kevinisms. I feel like I'm going to have to make a whole podcast of that now. Yeah, I think so. That'd be great. I, I'm ready to listen to it. So, I'll, I'll tell you a couple things that have kind of given me a little bit of solace. Um, these aren't really data driven necessarily. They're kind of um, anecdotal, but here they go. Number one, I don't get the flu every year. Um, I do take the flu vaccine, but even with the flu vaccine, if you actually get exposed to the flu, many people have mild symptoms, and I don't get them every year. So what that tells me is that, the, and this maybe tells something for some of your listeners to think about, is we as a certain population of people may do just enough social distancing that until this vaccine comes around, we may actually have a relatively lower likelihood of contracting this especially as more and more patients that we run it or people that we run into are actually recovered COVID, COVID positive patients because they should have we think some level of immunity so it gives me a little bit of solace to know that it's not like everybody's going to get this it's the moment we all get out of our houses because i don't get the flu every year and the flu is pretty darn contagious and not everybody had measles and measles is 20 or 30 times more contagious we think than this coronavirus so feel like you might be able to live your life even with this being around if you are a high-risk patient and that's something that i i think people should be able to internalize that your life will be able to go on and that many of us may just have to decide to live you know live like our dad lives not the way we live so don't go to the bars don't go to some of these other things have a certain amount of respect for where your hands are and be a bit of a hand Nazi, you know, keep them clean. If you think they're going near your mouth, pull out something to disinfect them before you do that. If your eye is itching, spray them before you rub your eye. And I think some of those behaviors will be a part of the new normal. So I would say that's one thing. Um, the other thing I would actually say is, um, and I hope I don't get in trouble for bringing up anything that even resembles politics, but at least another Kevinism here is that there is plenty of evidence that there is a way that our country should be posturing so that we can minimize the sequelae of something that's unplanned. And you know, just because we haven't had a pandemic in a while doesn't mean that we should dismantle our pandemic response. Uh, Bill Gates did a terrific set of talks around our pandemic readiness and basically nobody listened. Um, he's been on the news a few times now talking about them. So I think the other message here is we've really got to be informed citizens in this country because the world is complicated and, you know, selecting somebody to lead because of criteria that don't actually relate to their ability to deliver the goods of what we need a federal person to do could be a problem in the future. And so I think I said that as carefully and delicately as I could. You said but it I, would just ask you. I, I loved it. I think that's uh, I 100 uh, percent agree with you. Um, and I, I, it's, it's well said, very well said. Um, Jennifer, anything to add to that uh, before I close? I think we have covered it beautifully. I think um, this was a really interesting conversation for me, just someone, like I said earlier, who is not very familiar at all with informatics and the technology. It's made it interesting to me. And if it was all as, as easy as this to absorb and learn, I, I think more and more <laughs> of us would, would be 
embracing this and, and I know um, I will continue to listen to the podcasts and um, because you've made it you've made it fun. Well, I just want to thanks. Uh, I want to say thanks again to all our listeners, um, our podcast team, of course, Jennifer and Dylan, um, and of course, our special guest and close friend and mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Kevin Johnson from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, I would urge you all to watch this short film on the electronic health record go live at Vanderbilt University and Medical uh, Medical Center in 2017. His movie, which is on Amazon Prime called No Matter Where, which talks about the communication of healthcare data. Um, and for sure, please tune in to his podcast, which is called Informatics in a, in a Round, which can be found on Spotify, iTunes, uh, which he goes through various informatics and healthcare topics with some smart and personable guests and you, you'll get a good laugh because they're 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 very intelligent and uh have a lot of great things to say but they're funny they're really really funny um uh, i'm certainly enjoying all of this and uh, additionally we we will post information about the podcast on the sma website so that you can easily find it uh thank you all and uh, until next time Thank you for joining us. To subscribe to additional podcasts, visit sma.org slash podcasts.